Okay, hello, truth seekers. We're at a very special moment in history. Here you have uh, Wall Street bets, memifying the Robin Hood application, robbing the hood. In the midst of the GameStop controversy this week, Davos convenes and the World Economic Forum Supreme Leader Klaus Schwab introduces Chinese Chairman Xi as the open keynote speaker for the conference. Mr. President, I believe this is the best time to reset our policies and to work jointly for a peaceful and prosperous world. We all welcome now His Excellency Xi Jinping, President of the People's Republic of China. Professor Klaus Schwab. I'm DM'd about the counter plan to the Great Reset known as Nasara. I mean the currency reset also called the Great Currency Reset, involving the Iraqi dinar. But the said hero who's going to bring that Great Financial Currency Reset in opposition to the NWO Great Reset has been politically slain, for lack of a better term. And although there have been many rumors, there has been no clear-cut plan explained by the former Commander-in-Chief to rectify the travesty of November 3rd and eventually bring about his great plan. In this video, I'll try to investigate if all of these recent events are somehow interrelated. First, I'll start off with a intro by billionaire Chamath Palapapatiya to see his perspective on how the GameStop controversy began. Okay, so we turn to billionaire investor Chamath. Not remain a video game retailer that over prioritizes its brick and mortar footprint and stumbles around the online ecosystem. November of 2020, Someone in Wall Street bets highlights that a hedge fund called Melvin Capital was going long GameStop puts. What does that mean? That they are synthetically shorting the stock by buying the right to sell it at a different price in the future. Okay, um, and that they had been long that position for more than four years. So all the way going back to 2016. Fast forward to now. 2021 of this year. January of 2021, GameStop strikes an agreement with Ryan Cohen and adds him to the board of directors and gives two of his affiliates, his former COO and, and CFO of Chewy, also two board seats. They collectively, you know, bring their experience in e-commerce, online marketing, finance, and strap planning. The stock goes up 13% on that day and closes at about 20 bucks a share. One day later, <laughs> And then over the next day after that, so for January 12th and 13th of 2021, there's a ton of activity around GameStop in Wall Street bets and now in Discord and in stock twits claiming that Ryan Cohen is going to be the savior. And then by January 14th, so three days later, the stock closes at 40 bucks. So now it's up 125%. So now comes the setup, the pros versus the Joes. From January 12th to today, there has basically been a battle by institutional investors on one side, shorting GameStop, and retail investors on the other, buying the stock and also buying the right to buy the stock, or what's called call options. And this is what has created this crazy nonsense we've seen. So on the institutional side, after you know retail drives the stock up, the institutional guys are like, hey, wait a minute, you know, Ryan Cohen's an idiot. You know, this company is fucked. Fuck these guys. They have too many, you know, cyclical and secular tailwinds. And they become so massively short that the infrastructure that's supposed to even count all the shares can't keep up. And now they are short more than the actual number of shares that actually exist. So now they're 140% short. The Joes, retail, they start to aggressively purchase all these call options. And on January 13th and 14th, um, this price keeps ticking up. Then a bunch of quant funds and momentum hedge funds notice all this activity. And they also participate on the long <laughs> side. And then over the past seven trading days, we have traded over $100 billion of stock in GameStop, which is well in excess of what retail can support. So here's what's crazy to realize. A bunch of value-oriented, non-computerized, non-quantitative hedge funds short. Retail notices a dislocation, initially fundamentally, but then momentum-oriented buys. Other hedge funds realize also buy 
And this is what's created this massive short squeeze. On January 19th, Citroen Research, a research firm that basically tries to you know, find shorts in the market, announces that they were short GameStop and they gave five reasons why it should go to 20 bucks. The stock was at 35.50 on January 19th. Then over the next two days, GameStop calls hit an all-time high and it runs a two-day rally of almost 70%. And this is what really starts what's called a gamma squeeze, okay, which is what we saw in the first part of this week. So January 25th, Ken Griffin, Stevie Cohen, they inject almost $3 billion into Melvin Capital, the firm that was short, $2 billion from Citadel and seven fifty from from Stevie Cohen. Stevie Cohen had a billion in it from before. And then now all of a sudden the squeeze keeps happening. The squeeze keeps happening. And then it starts to spill over to the rest of the market. Now all these hedge funds, these original hedge funds, they are getting called by the bank saying, hey, wait a minute, you've run over your collateral limits. You need to post more collateral. We need more money in your bank accounts. So now not only do they have to cover GameStop, they have to cover all their other shorts. So those go crazy. And they have to sell their longs. So now they're selling you know, Facebook, Netflix, Alibaba. <laughs> so those things are going down. That accordion is what's been happening in the market in the last couple of days. And then the coup de grace is what happened on January 28th of 2021. Brokerage firms, and this is where, Jason, we should talk about this, like Robinhood and Interactive Brokers, because in fairness, it wasn't just Robinhood, prevented their users from buying GameStop and a handful of other stocks. They were only able to sell which resulted in such a one-way pressure, it caused a 44% sell-off yesterday. Now, that's been reversed today. And so what it speaks to is a bunch of questions. There are questions as to whether or not this was mandated by the platforms or the regulators. Given the fact that it didn't impact all the brokerage accounts, it was a platform-level decision. So some organizations like Robinhood banned it. Some organizations did not. And it could be that some of these platforms that banned it is likely because, and this is where we get to the insolvency question, didn't have enough margin. And so they knew that if they opened the doors, there would be a run on the bank and there would be a run on Robinhood. And that's why they basically, I believe, had to stop um, allowing people to trade. And it just shows how, um, how fragile um, the whole system is. The last thing I'll say, and then we can talk about this, is uh, how does Robinhood make money, which I think is also important to understand this. Robinhood makes money through a mechanism that's called payment for order flow. So they don't make money from consumers, right? What they do is they watch and monitor your orders. They create a data file about that, and they give it to these prime brokerage prime brokerage institutions like Citadel, milliseconds before you do the trade. What that allows Citadel to do is if they see a lot of people buying, milliseconds before you buy, they can buy. And that allows them to make money. So to be clear, Citadel is responsible for 47% of all the payment for order flow volume. They paid Robinhood almost $60 million in the third quarter. Okay? Um, plus another, I think... You know, seven and a half million for S and P five hundred stocks, and thirty one million for non S and P five hundred stocks. They paid them almost a hundred million in the quarter, or a four hundred million dollar run rate. So, if we had to summarize all of this in a nutshell, that's what we know. We know that it started out as people debating the true fundamental value of GameStop, and it morphed into a momentum trade where a bunch of folks got dogmatic about a short. A bunch of folks got dogmatic about being long, and the longs won. And in the middle, what happened was a bunch of firms basically decided at some point to gate the ability for people to transact in all of this, which I think caused a lot of economic disruption. And that was because they didn't have the margin requirements. And I think it's because they were insolvent, i.e. Robinhood. Jamal gave one of the best overviews of the situation I think I've heard specifically with regard to GameStop's consumer versus industry investor war. If you want to hear the rest of this excellent podcast, it is episode 19, Robin Hood's GameStop decision on the All In podcast on YouTube. So in an intro from Chamath, the company Citadel was mentioned. 
Many investors, realizing that a possible unclean relationship existed between Citadel and Robinhood, started to seek out brokers who do not have such a relationship. I came across this interesting article, or really it's just a post from a financial advisor who goes by the handle Timmy from Charlotte on Discord. This claimed insider gives us some additional insight on where Citadel operates. You can find this particular post on Reddit under the R Robinhood subreddit with the title, what is Citadel and where do I get away from them? Or where do I go to get away from them? The interesting tidbit, um, this information is not confirmed, is that at least per this particular source, Citadel operates with a variety of stockbrokers. The alternatives that have been talked about have been TDA, that's TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, E-Trade, WeBull, Fidelity. But as you see in this particular table, each of those brokers I've mentioned have a sizable percentage of their stock orders handled by the company Citadel. Um, so you see here with Fidelity, it's almost half for market orders, 52.28% and 45.9% for limit orders. Same goes for Webull, 50.85%. And 53.71%. One of the businesses listed, Apex Clearing, also handles orders. And specifically for the businesses Webull, Tastyworks, among others, but not Robinhood. The CEO of Webull claimed that it was the order trade restriction placed by Apex Clearing that led to a limit on stock orders that retail investors could buy on that last Thursday. Thursday, January 28th, 2021, was that special day in history where multiple stock trading accounts limited buyers from purchasing stock orders for specific high interest stocks, but they did allow them to sell those stocks, seemingly creating an advantage for the short seller hedge funds who could buy up any sold stocks at a lower price. Another millionaire investor, Stephen Graham, offers his perspective of this aspect of the controversy. But I hate to say it, guys, as interesting as it is to think about Robinhood trying to protect Citadel, trying to protect Melvin Capital by disabling the buy button, the actual reason could possibly be a little less exciting than you think. Remember, the buy button of GameStop was temporarily disabled across multiple brokerages extending way beyond just Robinhood. Even the CEO of Webull went on record yesterday to explain that their clearinghouse, Apex, was dealing with a behind-the-scenes issue and had to disable trading against their wishes. See, when you buy or sell a stock, that money does not immediately change hands even though it'll show up instantly for you in your account. Instead, the money goes through a clearing process where all of those transactions are recorded and settled about two days later. But what happens if the person you bought your stock from goes bankrupt before the clearinghouse is able to settle the transaction? Then all of a sudden the broker can't deliver your shares so they go to the clearinghouse but they can't deliver your shares because the person they were getting it from went bankrupt. So they now have to pay out of pocket but when the price of the stock skyrockets to unbelievable numbers, the clearinghouse simply doesn't have that much in reserves, and that could cause them to go under as well. Essentially, there weren't enough shares of GameStop available to buy. They couldn't margin call the short sellers fast enough to provide liquidity. They couldn't guarantee that those stocks would be available when you bought them. And they didn't want to be on the hook for the next two days if they couldn't provide you with the stock that you bought at the price that you bought it for. Then apparently, the depository trust company who clears transactions saw this happening and told their clearinghouse that starting immediately, they they will need 100% collateral on hand in order to cover the price of the stock being bought. But clearinghouses didn't have that type of capital on hand with a moment's notice. And brokerages didn't want to be on the hook for delivering shares that might not exist. So the only option was to refuse to clear GameStop purchases, which in turn caused brokerages unable to offer those shares for sale. Unfortunately, the Robinhood CEO did a really bad job explaining this. But the CEO of Webull was very upfront about the situation, and this probably makes more sense. Plus, Webull's going to 
to be offering you four free stocks when you deposit $100 on the platform using a link down below in the description, and that could be worth all the way up to $1,600. Now, anyways, what they said 100% confirmed to be the case, maybe, maybe not. Is it possible that the clearinghouses are all in on it and trying to crash the stock as well? Who knows? I know it's fun to band together and try to pick an enemy, and Robinhood is definitely the easy target. But at least I'm going to be giving you all the information, and then you can make a decision for yourself. Now, as far as where we go from here, we have two sides to the coin. One, we have the SEC who wants to monitor market volatility and communications around stocks like this, alongside with regulation around communities like Wall Street bets. And two, we have hundreds of others who want to monitor the stock trading platforms to ensure that stocks are readily open for buying and selling without restriction. One side argues that Reddit artificially drove up the demand and the price of GameStop, while the other side says that they just took advantage of greedy Wall Street funds who exploited the system by overly shorting the stock and trying to drive down the price. To me, Robinhood disabling the buy button is just like pouring gasoline on the fire. But the way I see it, this event is most likely almost guaranteed to cause further regulation to prevent something like this from happening again in the future. Most likely, the SEC is going to find a way to prevent Event more than 100% of the shares from being shorted all at once. That way, there's not going to be this cataclysmic slingshot of value in the event that the price starts going up. And that would end up definitely softening the blow for something like this happening again. And even though I'm 100% sure they're going to start to pay very close attention to communities like Wall Street bets, that's going to be very difficult to ever enforce, especially if a lot of people just like the stock. And it's going to be difficult to calculate how much market perception influences is the price that someone is willing to pay for whatever stock they want to buy. Or how much value is attributed to hype versus someone's real conviction about buying a stock that they believe is undervalued. But I think one thing is for sure. Disabling the buy button was not the right way to do it. And I was upset that this was seen as the best solution to what I think is a much greater problem. If you agree with me on this, just make sure to subscribe and smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. Uh, I really appreciate the perspective of Graham. Uh, however, I will at this point not rule out the possibility of corruption on behalf of Robinhood and their close relationship with Citadel. If you want to hear more from Graham, I suggest you uh, subscribe to his YouTube channel. He gives great advice, though he is not a certified financial advisor. I recently commented on a review video comparing Charles Schwab to Fidelity to Vanguard. It's an excellent review. My particular comment was how many are here after the Robin Hood debacle January 2021. Jake Brope's conclusion is that you can't really go wrong with either one of these. But importantly, both Fidelity and Schwab have branch locations, credit cards, checking account, the option of buying fractions of stock and trading software. Vanguard directly pays you to hold your money. I was also affected by the debacle. Uh, here you see I purchased the Express stock on Thursday. Um, I wanted to possibly purchase additional stock, but I wasn't able to on this particular application called Robinhood. It only allowed the ability to sell stock, not to purchase new stock. The same here with BlackBerry. So many speculate that this restriction on buying stock is what precipitated this huge drop you see here which occurred on that Thursday. The same with AMC. This is the mobile interface for Fidelity. This particular screen is for buying stock. Here's another page on the application. Here is the Charles Schwab mobile app interface for buying stock. For my evaluation of the mobile applications, I decided that Fidelity has a better appearing mobile interface compared to Charles Schwab. It is not quite as good as Robinhood, but I would choose it over Charles Schwab, Robinhood, Webull, and Sophie, and TD Ameritrade, because all of the previously named companies have demonstrated some trade restrictions over the last few days for the very popular meme stocks, GME, AMC, BlackBerry, Nokia, and a few others. I had learned on Reddit that as far as the process of transferring your stock from Robinhood to another firm such as Fidelity is concerned, it would take about a minimum of four to five business days. 
So it may be not an appropriate action over the course of the next week if you are expecting the price of those said meme stocks to jump up during that time. Here's how the Biden administration is handling the recent controversy. How is the SEC, DOJ, or broader administration specifically looking at Robinhood and other platforms' decisions to prevent retail investors from purchasing certain stocks like GameStop? I don't have anything more on this aside from to point you to the SEC statement. How is the SEC, DOJ? Here's a memeable moment from New York hedge fund billionaire Leon Corporan on the whole issue. The reason the market is doing what it's doing is people are sitting at home getting the checks from the government, okay, and this fair share is a bullshit concept. It's just a way of attacking wealthy people, and, you know, I think it's inappropriate. We all got to work together and pull together. The reason the market... It's very easy to conclude from his defensiveness that we are indeed dealing with a class warfare issue. Our previous president, Donald Trump, has been castigated thoroughly. He's considered the maestro of death and destruction, this in relation to those five people who had died in the Capitol riot. But some theorists wonder, what if instead Trump is actually the maestro of these recent financial events? So again, I was DM'd this very interesting document. Dinar Recaps, RV excerpts from Restored Republic via GCR, Global Currency Reset, update Wednesday, 27 January 2021. Judy, banks have been notified that the Global Currency Reset was Wednesday, 26th of January. As with currencies of 209 nations of the globe participating in the GCR, the U.S. dollar would be defunct and a new asset gold-backed U.S. Treasury note would be recognized. GCR liquidity began Tuesday, 26 January, the same day that Redemption Center staff had a five-hour meeting. On that Tuesday, there was a gag order placed on bond movement at UST headquarters in Miami and Reno. That order will be lifted so as to access liquidity between Tuesday night and Wednesday, 27 January morning. Sometime on 26, Wells Fargo's 1.4 million notification email should go out along with publication of DINAR websites that a secured website gives access to 800 numbers from which in a tier 4B could be set to exchange redemption appointments worldwide. Now, the only issue with this reading I gave you so far is it covers the topic of the DINAR global currency reset. This topic is now almost a decade old. Three years ago, there was an extremely popular topic called uh, hidden bank accounts also known as the hidden secret TDA accounts. The theory surrounding the secret accounts relates to another theory that became popular during the US 2008 housing market crash. At that time, due to increased suffering of poverty in relation to people losing everything, people began to look into the history of the United States and focused particularly on some documents suggesting that it had been incorporated in the state of Delaware. They point to specific key time points such as 1871, 1912, 1933, 1945. There is elaborate theory involved with the nature of social security accounts and the nature of birth certificates, especially given certain interesting coincidences like the fact that on the face of dollar bills there is letters uh, A through L which are 12 letters to coincide with 12 regions for Federal Reserve banks to coincide with 12 methods of division of Social Security numbers, a process of determining Social Security numbers which stopped sometime in the 90s as far as I'm aware. RV is revaluation. Supposedly the Iraqi dinar was to be reevaluated at a different price point as a part of a global currency reset connected with something else called Nasara. I knew about the alleged 800 numbers that would be given out over three years ago. Um, however, to this day, it doesn't appear those numbers have been given out. In contrast to a financial reset by patriotic individuals who want to improve the state of whichever country they're from, we instead get eight predictions in the world for 2030. Agenda 2030. The Great Reset. What's really been the focus of the current meeting of Davos? Look at this. You own nothing and you'll be happy. Whatever you want, you'll rent and it'll be delivered by drone. 
the U.S. won't be the world's leading superpower. It'll be China. A handful of countries will dominate. You won't die waiting for an organ donor. You won't transplant organs, we'll print new ones instead. You eat much less meat. An occasional treat, not a staple, for good of the environment and our health. A billion people will be displaced by climate change. We'll have to do a better job welcoming and integrating refugees. Polluters will have to pay a carbon dioxide tax. There will be a global price on carbon and will help make fossil fuels history. You could be preparing to go to Mars. Scientists will have worked out how to keep you healthy in space to start a journey to find alien life. Western values will have been tested to breaking point. Checks and balances that underpin our democracies must not be forgotten. So that really is the topic of the current meeting. And this occurred, this new meeting of Davos has occurred around the same time this controversy concerning the game stock and the war between the billionaire hedge fund investors and the little men. CBS News calls the Great Reset a conspiracy theory that takes aim at President-elect Joe Biden, uh, when in reality, Joe Biden's initial executive orders immediately attack the fossil fuel industry and try to prop up the electricity green energy, even though, funnily, many of the electrical energy sources rely on coal for the generation, which is a fossil fuel. Joe Biden is indeed doing everything in his power to promote the 2030 agenda. That short video I showed you advertising the changes for 2030 was put out by the World Economic Forum. I will not go more in depth in a, on that video for this particular discussion, but the implications of it are profound and should be considered. Now I briefly turn to the topic of Elon Musk. Many consider Elon Musk to be somewhat of an iconoclast, an original thinker who does not care about status quo. Now deeper in the internet, in the Patriot community, there is a theory that Elon Musk is working with Donald Trump in military intelligence for the purpose of eventually salvaging and saving our country. I try to relate the events of Trump's removal from office January 20th with these recent financial events, the GameStop issue as well as the Davos meeting. Elon's actions may leak the two topics. Elon Musk knows that he is an influencer on the internet. He has 44 million followers. Almost anything he tweets spreads far and wide. He's taken some interesting actions over the last several days. A few days ago, he put up this hashtag Bitcoin on his profile. This resulted immediately in a rise of Bitcoin from $33,000 to $37,000 a coin. A few days ago, he posted this particular picture, which is a dog. The Twitter universe perceived that this was dog whistling for the type of cryptocurrency called doggy coin. Doggy coin then went on a run all the way up to eight cents from less than one cent. On the 27th, just three days ago, Musk comments, even Discord has gone corpo. Uh, this was a subtle reference to the Discord website removing another website group called Wall Street Bets from participating due to hate speech and language. Essentially, bad actors infiltrated Wall Street bets, then infiltrated the Discord group and started to type things, which got the group booted at a very pivotal moment. For it was Wall Street bets which largely drove the initial interest in, in blocking the shorting effort of GME by buying the stock. And just the day before, Elon simply post game stock and post a link to the Wall Street bets Reddit page. This spread far and wide throughout the internet, largely helping to influence people to purchase the stock. Just briefly going a little further into the hidden lore of Elon, there is this guy's claim, Austin Steinbart. So how, how, how close are you with Mr. Mr. Elon Musk? What'd you say? How close are you with Mr. Elon Musk? Oh, uh, I can't get it too much to you. All I can say is that he knows me very well. He knows me very well. 
So a part of this hidden lore is the idea that there are hidden secret technologies that are extremely advanced. Elon is has supposed to be in read in to the understanding of some of these secret technologies and is also in the process of helping to develop the technologies. Ben Fader covers some of this history fairly well in his particular video, which he had posted April 24th of last year. Um, just highlighting things from this particular video, Austin posts Space Force on YouTube. Elon Musk tweets, hardcore technologists are unaware. Uh, then this Austin person goes to jail. Uh, Shelby messages Elon Musk, free Austin. Elon Musk replies, I agree. Um, Elon Musk then changes the profile picture to Deuce X and tweets a summary of the game. And Deuce X is basically a game about uh, a dystopia. Uh, the phrase Deuce X is also the first two words for the word for the term Deuce X Machina, uh, which is a literary concept of a plot that seems to head in a direction where the hero is about to lose in the story. But an artificial contrivance is suddenly created, uh, wherein the plot changes and the hero turns out to do okay, usually due to the intervention of some sort, which has a magical aspect to it. The term literally meaning God from machine. I say all this to suggest that many think that Elon Musk is a white hat patriot who has a very high level of clearance in the US government. Um, they would speculate that he made those special recent tweets concerning GameStop, Bitcoin, and Dogecoin because he's acting in a way as like a conductor for a series of social events that will eventually relate to President Donald Trump in the near future. This is obviously rampant speculation. While there are many strange coincidences over the last several weeks, none of these have definitively shown evidence of a secret military plot to save the country. But anywho, there's General McKerney, Colonel Waldron, Austin Steinbart, Elon Musk, many characters in the background who seem to be a part of a plot of sorts, all with very intriguing information and actions. Time will tell if there is indeed a bigger story and how the roles of these individuals in the story is defined. Either these specific events we're seeing today with the Davos conference with a plan to introduce the NWO Agenda 2030 and recent financial controversies in the United States exist as either standalone complexes having no real connection or there is a deeper narrative which will surprise everyone once the full story is finally told. If interesting things occur, I'll address those in a subsequent video. Thanks for watching.